what if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better? Father, we certainly want to love better. Father, teach us how to be a witness for you, a witness for your son, Jesus. Jesus said, by all this, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have loved one to another. Father, we want to know how to do that. And certainly, Father, we want to be a witness for you. Teach us that. Teach us in your word today. We are thrilled to have your word. Please make it clear to us what you're saying. Use my voice, Father, but we want your word to teach us today. That's what we're asking as a blessing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Church on YouTube or Rumble, whichever platform you're watching this on. Uh, I'm Pastor Grant Forsyth, and welcome to In His Grace Community Church. And uh, it is Sunday, January 31st, and uh, here we are on YouTube to, uh, again, gather together. Gathering together is really important. Uh, we're gathering together in person on Sundays for those who feel comfortable. For those of you who don't and are watching online, we're still gathering together. Amen? And um, uh, I'm just thrilled that we even have this platform so that we can do this for those of you who cannot make it out. Uh, so, anyways, glad you're here. Uh, I have a message today that I want to bring to you that is going to require a lot of uh, background information, all right? So my introduction today for this message is going to be longer than usual, all right? Because most of the message today is going to be in that introduction. When we get to the end of the uh, verses and that I'm going to share with you today, then it will become clear the message that I want to bring to you, which won't be as long. <laughs> the introduction is actually going to be the longest part. Okay, so we're going to start with this idea. Actually, it's not a new idea right? Is God still in control? And we've been asking that question for the last couple of weeks, haven't we? And uh, we're going to approach it on another level today. The last couple of weeks, we've talked about it in a couple of different ways. So if you've missed those, uh, they are on this platform for you to go back and watch the last couple messages if you want to catch up. Uh, this is just another side of this to show us that, yes, God is in control and how, and how it Important it is for us to believe that that is true. Now, to get where we're going to go today, I need to do the background uh, and, and read some background verses, okay? And we're going to be starting in Deuteronomy 18. So we're starting in the Old Testament. And in this set of verses, uh, we're going to set up, we're going to set the scene for our subject today. Uh, and this verses we read uh, where Moses is talking to the Israelites, and he's passing on to them a very important piece of information, okay? And so here it starts out in verse 15 of Deuteronomy 18. Here's what he says. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet. So he's talking about the future at this point. There's a future time when the Lord your God is going to raise up a prophet like me. Moses says, from among you, from your fellow Israelites. So he's talking about a descendant of 
the Israelites. He doesn't identify exactly which tribe at, at this point. And it's going to be a prophet that God is going to raise up like me. And, and when we say like me, Moses had a unique position. He was an intermediary between God and the Israelites. Okay, he was in the middle. He went to God uh, with prayers and concerns and requests. And God gave him the messages to take back to the Israelites. God did not speak directly to the Israelites. Now there's a reason for that. And God actually set it up that way. And it's kind of funny the way it happens. All right. So Moses is going to explain how that, why that is. He's still talking to the Israelites and he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, right? From among you, from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. This is a prophet in the future that you must listen to him. Now, those are really, really important words. We're going to see an answer to this, okay? Because we're going to come back to this very saying, you must listen to him. Now, spoiler alert, okay? Who is this prophet? Because there were lots of prophets in the Old Testament. Who is this prophet that Moses is talking about that God is going to raise up? I'm going to give you the spoiler right now. It's going to end up being Jesus. Now, if you're not sure uh, that what I'm saying is true, I'm going to prove it to you in a few minutes, okay? So just know ahead of time as we're going through this that we're actually talking about a prophecy of the coming of Jesus, okay? Have that in your mind as we go on, okay? You must listen to him, and we're going to identify him in a few moments, all right? For this is what you asked of the Lord your God. You're the ones that asked for this, okay? At Horeb, Horeb is a mountain, and it's synonymous with Mount Sinai. They're both called, it's the same place. Sometimes they call it Mount Horeb. Sometimes they call it Mount Sinai. It's the same place on the day of the assembly. They were assembled before God at this mountain. When you said, you're the ones that said this, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God nor see his great fire, see this great fire anymore, or we will die. <laughs> In other words, at this assembly at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, it's the same. It was such a supernatural and frightening and terrifying thing that the Israelites literally thought they were going to die. And they said, look, we don't want to hear this voice because we think we're going to die, okay? We don't want to hear that voice. We want to see the great fire. We think we're going to die. We don't want to hear from God directly. They're the ones that asked for that, okay? And so God doesn't talk to them directly. He talks to Moses instead. So when we go on, okay, oh, here's, the, here's kind of a scene to set it up. It's the mountain Moses is up on this mountain. He's talking to God when he receives the law. And there's a cloud up there and there's fire. And the, the Israelites are all encamped on the plain, probably somewhere near two million people. And this phenomenon was so powerful, they thought they were going to die. And he says, look, Moses, you go talk to God. <laughs> we'll stay down here. And then come back and tell us what he said. That's kind of a paraphrase of what was happening. Because they did not want to hear God's voice. It was so terrifying to them. And so that's what God did. He spoke with Moses. Moses would speak to the people. The people would complain to Moses. Moses would go back to God and speak to God. This is how it happened. Moses was an intermediary between the Israelites and God. And that was fine with the Israelites because they did not want to hear the voice of God. They were frightened. All right. That's why they said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord, okay, or our God, nor see this great fire or we will die. Okay. So God answers Moses here. Now God is talking to Moses. He said to me, Moses says, what they say is good. Good. This is going to work out just fine. What they say is good. 
I will rise up for them a prophet. God is repeating back to Moses the thing that Moses said to the people. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. So the message is going to come from God. He will tell them everything I command him. So this prophet who, spoiler alert, is going to be Jesus. Okay, I'll prove that to you in a moment. This prophet is going to tell them everything. Everything that needs to be said is going to be said by this prophet. He doesn't say I'm going to tell him most things and then we'll let others tell more. No, he will tell them everything that needs to be told, I command him. If I command it, he's going to tell him. Okay? God is setting up the parameters of how this prophet, this future prophet, how that's going to work. Okay, you got a picture of that? You must listen to him. Really important. And he will tell them everything that I command him. He's going to be the one to tell you. He's going to be the one to bring the message. Not some of the messages, all of them. Jesus ends up being that one. Okay? All right? A prophet like you, he will tell them everything. All right? Now, as we go on, God is still talking and he says, I myself will call to account. Okay, there is going to be an accounting here. Anyone who does not listen to my words, uh-oh, that the prophet speaks in my name. So not only is this prophet going to speak everything that is commanded by God, this is the one who will do that, there is going to be an accounting that takes place for those who do not listen to this future prophet that God is going to raise up. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? All right, but there's always got to be a but, right? But <laughs> a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded. In other words, if somebody says, I got a message from the Lord and the Lord didn't send him, they are presuming. To speak in the name of God. They're, they believe that they're a prophet, but they're not. Okay? If a prophet presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or there's a second category, that's the first category, there's a second category that's just like it, he says, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods. I want you to notice these are both in the same category. The first one who presumes to speak for God, but he's not. He's saying, I got a message from God, but he doesn't. It's not from God. And the other category, these are together, that someone who speaks in the name of another God that comes along and says, hey, you know, you, we got to check out this Baal guy or this, this Asherah or Dagon or, or, or Molech, you know, the Canaanite gods. That's a pretty bad thing to turn the people away from God and toward these other gods. Well, he puts these two in the same category. If you're going to talk, turn the people away to other gods, or if you're to presume to speak in the name of God and he hasn't sent you, this is serious. What are they supposed to do with these guys? What are they supposed to do with these prophets if this happens? Well, here's the answer, and it's not good, all right? Is to be put to death. Wow. That's pretty serious, isn't it? If somebody presumes to speak for God, but God hasn't sent them, and they have some message, some prophetic message, I've got a message from God, I heard from God, and he does not. He's supposed to be put to death in this culture, in this age. The same as another prophet that comes along to say, hey, we need to check out these other gods. In this age, in this time, they were supposed to put them to death. 
Now, today, I'll jump ahead a little bit because Jesus is the, is the prophet that God is going to raise up, right? Well, Jesus fulfilled the law, and this is the law of Moses. Jesus fulfilled the law, so because of that, we don't put people to death for prophesying not from God, but claiming to prophesy from God. We don't put people to death, okay? That just doesn't happen anymore. But I think it should tell us how serious this was. This was a big deal. This was so serious that you could die for this back in this day in this culture. Wow. God is really serious about this, isn't he? He goes on and he says, you may say to yourselves, all right, you may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? How are we supposed to tell? If someone is speaking to us as if they're presumingly speaking from God, how are we supposed to know whether this is a prophet of God or not? Well, God gives the answer. If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, they say it's going to happen and it doesn't, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously. So do not be alarmed. And if they've spoken presumptuously, well, we know what the end is supposed to be for them back in this day, okay? Not today. Wow. So if somebody says that something's going to happen and it doesn't, well, this is the formula for what we call a false prophet. A false prophet. And it's not like you get it right sometimes and other times you don't get it. No, you get it wrong one time. Just one time. And you are a false prophet. And they're supposed to get rid of them. All right. Now, in Deuteronomy 13, I don't have time to read it. You can read it on your own. But there's another side of this formula. And this is the formula where if a prophet comes and does some kind of a, a sign or a wonder, a miracle, or a, says something's going to happen or whatever, and it happens, it happens. And you might think, wow, this is a prophet of God. It does take place. But that prophet then steers you away from God and towards other gods, you see. Which tells us that there will be some people who will be able to do some miracles. There is a dark spiritual side of our universe. We do have a dark spiritual enemy. That enemy does have some powers and may be able to do some signs and wonders. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a prophet of God because if they turn you away from God into other gods, well, that's the same thing. It's a false prophet. Okay, so there's two categories of false prophets here. One who presumes to speak and presumes that they're sent by God, but they're not. They say something's going to happen and it doesn't. And all it takes is one time. Okay, one time. And the other category is a prophet who performs a sign and wonder, and it, it actually happens. But they turn away. They turn you away from what God says. They turn you away from God. That's another component of a false prophet. Okay? This is a big deal, and we know what was supposed to happen to them. Okay, pretty dangerous stuff, isn't it, in, the, in, the, in ancient Israel? But God did say, okay, those are the false prophets, but God says, I'm going to raise up a prophet like you, Moses. God is going to raise up that prophet from among you, their fellow Israelites. He, I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything, everything that needs to be said. Not some things, everything I command him. All right, so that would be a true prophet of God because he has sent them and he's given them words to say and those words are commands and we're supposed to listen to him, right? We're supposed to listen to that prophet, the one that's coming, and he will tell them everything. That is a future prophet from God that God is promising. Okay, we got a picture of that? This is a long introduction, okay? You see what I mean? 
So hang in there. We're getting there. You'll, you'll come to realize why I'm talking about this in a few minutes. Okay? Well, now we're going to go to the New Testament and we're going to answer the question of who this prophet is. All right? This is the answer to this is the prophet I'm raising up. This is the answer to that, and you must listen to him. This is where Jesus is identified as that prophet. So this scene, Matthew 17, um, I, it's the transfiguration. If you've ever read the story of the transfiguration, let me condense it for you. Uh, Jesus told his disciples that some of you, some of you disciples, are going to see the kingdom of God. And you're going to have a preview of the kingdom of God. And then one week later, he takes Peter, James, and John. Those are his closest disciples. Those are his most trusted disciples. Peter, Simon Peter, James, and John. He takes them up to a mountain. Does that sound familiar? A mountain. There's a cloud on this mountain. Okay, this is just like that first scene at the Mount Horeb. There's a cloud on the mountain. Jesus is on the mountain. Peter, James, and John are with him. And there's two others with, Je with Jesus on this mountain. And the two are Moses and Elijah the prophet. Now this is some kind of a vision. This is some kind of a uh, vision that's happening. Uh, because Jesus is giving them a preview of what he's going to look like when he is glorified. When he is He's going to go to the cross, he's going to die, but then he's going to be resurrected, and he's going to have a glorified body. He's giving Peter, James, and John a preview of that as the glorified Christ. He's glowing brightly. Remember the first mountain had fire, right? There's going to be a cloud surrounding them. The first mountain had a cloud, right? And Peter, James, and John are going to be in the place of the... Israelites who were encamped around the mountain. All the elements of that first meeting, at assembly at, at Mount Horeb, all of those elements are present in this story, the transfiguration. Okay? And look what happens. I'm just going to read a couple verses here. Verse 5 says, while he was still speaking, this is Simon Peter, he was babbling on about something because he didn't know what was going on, but he's still babbling, right? A bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said. So there's the cloud. They're on the mountain. There's Jesus glowing. There's Moses and Elijah standing next to him. We'll discover why that is in a moment. And there's a voice. Remember the voice on the first mountain? It was so scary that the Israelites said, we don't want to hear this voice anymore because we think we're going to die. Those are all there at this event. Okay? Notice what does the voice say? He says, this is my son whom I love. So this is the voice of God saying, he's like introducing Jesus. This is my son. That's not the first time he's done that. He did that at his baptism too. But at this one, he's saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Okay, and then he says what? Listen to him. Listen to him. Look, there were a lot of prophets in the Old Testament. A lot of prophets who came speaking for God, and they were prophets of God. There was Elijah, who's on the mountain with Jesus at this point. There was Elijah and then his follower, Elisha, there was Isaiah and Jeremiah, and, and, and there was Ezekiel, and there was Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Joel, Amos. There were many prophets that God raised up, but none of them did God say this in these words. And that's because this is the only place that God is identifying the prophet that he's going to raise up and he's identifying Jesus as his son as being that prophet. You must listen to him. He will tell you everything. Remember that? This is identifying Jesus. And when that voice came, you know what happened? What happened when the voice came? 
When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. (laughs) See, up to this point, they weren't terrified, were they? They were looking at what's happening. They're trying to figure out what's going on. There's a cloud. Peter's babbling on something because he doesn't know what to say. But all of a sudden, they're terrified because they've heard the voice. Just like the first mountain, all right? Just like the Israelites that heard the voice of God and says, we don't want to hear this voice. We think we're going to die. Well, they were terrified too. All the elements of Mount Horeb are now taking place on what we call the mountain of transfiguration. Jesus is on this mountain. His disciples are with him instead of the Israelites. There's a cloud. Instead of fire, there is Jesus illuminating in his glorious body. This is all probably a vision because Jesus had not gone to the cross yet. He's giving Peter, James, and John a preview so that they can be witnesses to the others. Right? You're getting all that? This is, these events are tied together. Now, I didn't have a really good picture of the transfiguration. The best one I could come up with is a painting by James Tassat, okay? Uh, So it's kind of the best I could gather together for this message, okay? So you have Peter, James, and John. They're terrified because they're hearing the voice, right? This one's covering his ears. See that? (laughs) Because he's terrified. You got Jesus who's glorified. This is a vision of him being glorified. You've got Moses represented by this figure here with Jesus and Elijah the prophet with Jesus. Now, why was Moses there in this vision? Well, it's actually pretty simple. It's kind of like handing off the baton. It's kind of like Moses said that God was going to raise up a prophet like him. And it's like Moses is there to pass the baton, to say, here he is, this is him. And Jesus fulfilled the law of Moses. Jesus lived that law perfectly. That's why he's been able to be our sacrifice for our sins. So this is, it makes sense that Moses is there in this vision. Jesus fulfilled the law and Moses is, is kind of like saying, here he is. It's all yours now. <laughs> okay, but why is Elijah there? Elijah's there. What? Why Elijah? What is his part in all of this? Well, again, this is very, very simple, really. Elijah was looked upon uh, by the Israelites down through the ages. He was the epitome of the prophets. He was like the 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 main prophet of Israel. The things that Elijah did were so fantastic, the signs and wonders, that he just kind of represents all the prophets. And it was prophesied that there would be a prophet like Elijah, and they used Elijah's name. So again, it's a handing off. You know what he's handing off? He's handing off the system of prophets. Jesus fulfilled the law. Jesus also fulfills the system of the prophets. Jesus is that last prophet that God said would be raised up. He'll tell you everything. You're not going to need more prophets. You're not going to need to be told other messages. No, everything that God said that he has commanded is going to be said by this prophet. And so Elijah is over here and it's kind of like he is handing off the function of all the system of prophets to Jesus because he is the final prophet of God. Do you see how this all comes together? Jesus is the fulfillment of all of that. All right? That's why Moses said that God will raise up a prophet like me. You must listen to him. And then what happened? God says, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. You don't find that phrase for other prophets. This is the prophet that God told Moses about and Moses told the people about. It is Jesus. Okay? And he will tell you everything that God commands. Okay? Interesting, right? Now, are you questioning the idea or the thought that Jesus is the final prophet? 
Well, just to put the last nail into this thing, Hebrews 1.1 just flat out says so. All right? We don't have to wonder if there's going to be more prophets beyond Jesus. It says in verse 1 of Hebrews 1, it starts, the letter starts with this, okay? In the past, not now, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. And there were lots of prophets that God sent with lots of messages. And they were individual messages. No one prophet had everything to say. Okay? They had specific messages. Okay? And he spoke to those prophets and those prophets spoke to the people. It's true. Okay? But, and there's always got to be a but, <laughs> but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Not the other prophets, not more prophets. When God said he will tell you everything, Jesus is the final prophet. He is the culmination of all the prophets. Everything points to Jesus, the law and the prophets. Jesus is that prophet, and we're not dealing with other prophets like in times past. There's, not, there's nowhere where Jesus said, I will send you a prophet and he'll speak for me. Nope, won't find it. No, he is that final prophet. All right? But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. All things are now he has authority over. We, we went through that last week. And through whom also he made the universe. You see, because this Jesus, the son of God, was there at creation and all things were made through him. Okay, this is another verse that confirms the deity of Christ of Jesus. He was there. And all things in creation were made through this Jesus. Alright? That's the prophet from God that was promised. You must listen to him. Are we listening to him? He said, I'll call into account those who do not listen to him. I think we need to listen to him. He will tell them everything. He's not going to tell you some things and leave other things to other prophets. Jesus is the the final prophet and he will tell you everything. Now, how does he do that? Did Jesus say everything on during his ministry on earth? And the answer is actually no. I mean, if you're thinking, well, I just got to read the red letters of the Bible because those are the words of Jesus, right? Well, actually... Here's what Jesus set up before he was betrayed. This is a few hours before his arrest and on his way to the cross. Just a few hours before, Jesus told his disciples this. He says, I have much more to say to you. I haven't told you everything yet. We're supposed to be told everything. He says, I have much more to say to you more than you can now bear. If I did say it all, you just couldn't bear it. So that means he has more to teach. Well, how did he do that? And as you read on in these verses, you find out that the way that this works is that Jesus was going to be speaking through the Holy Spirit that the Father was going to send. But the Holy Spirit would not speak on his own. The Holy Spirit would only say what Jesus would give him to say. So Jesus is still speaking through the Holy Spirit. Not prophets, not other people, through the Holy Spirit. So what happened? The Holy Spirit breathed the words of Scripture, and it is Jesus who's given us everything that God has commanded him. And that's why we have the New Testament. It's why we have the Old Testament too, by the way. But it's why we have the New Testament. It's because these have been spoken through the Spirit by Jesus to give us things today because he didn't, he, there's no way that he could say everything back then. And so everything that Jesus has said and is intended for us is already been written. We don't have more books to add to the Bible. The Bible is not, it's a, it's a closed canon. 
It's not something where we have some future books to add. Everything that was needed to be said has been said, has been written, and we have it today in our Bible. Jesus has told us everything that the Lord has commanded. Prophet from God, <clears throat> you must listen to him. Are we listening to him? He will tell you everything. He will tell you everything. Jesus did not promise to send more prophets. So why am I talking about this today? <laughs> I know, that was a long introduction, was it? <clears throat> I needed to lay that groundwork just to give you this, okay? This, this, this won't take long, all right? So don't panic, don't think, wow, Pastor Grant's just getting started. <clears throat> well, <laughs> that's probably true, but we're not going to... We're not going to be much longer. I needed to say all of that because of some of the things that have been happening in the last few months. Um, we've had a very contentious year. It's, look, it's been a tough year. 2020 has been a tough enough year. Uh, we've had a tough year with the COVID, right? We've had a lot of things happening with lockdowns, a lot of frustrated people. And then to top it all off, we've had a very contentious election. And unfortunately... Unfortunately, there have been those who have identified themselves as prophets, presuming to speak from God, and have made some predictions. Some predictions that they really should not have been making. Okay? And these were ended up being false prophecies. These are prophecies that are saying uh, that certain people are going to be in office, that certain uprisings were going to happen, that we're going to be under a martial law, that there's going to be this huge thing that's going to happen and cave down the government. And a lot of these have been tied to the church because some of these have been spoken by people who are supposed to be representing God. And it has done incredible damage, incredible damage to the witness of the church. Because now, a lot of people look at the church who've been saying these things that have not taken place. These have been false prophecies. And people have been looking at these and, and saying, wow, you people are crazy. This has been very bad for the witness of the church. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that our spiritual enemy is behind all of this to set it all up. But nevertheless... All of us are getting grouped in together into this terrible situation that culminated at the riots at the Capitol, uh, culminated at the, uh, the inauguration of the new president, and some really bad things have happened. And people are pointing at the church and lumping everybody together because a lot of these things were supposedly said in the name of Jesus. Okay, uh, I've got an article here called Crisis of Faith. It just came out a couple days ago. Uh, it's written by Jamie Dean. She's writing on behalf of World Magazine. And she's laying out some pretty bad things that have happened. There was a prophet. I'm not going to say his name. His name is in here, but I don't think it's necessary for me to tell you his name. But he <clears throat> made predictions that certain people would be in office, certain things would happen in a certain way of the election, all those things. Well, when it didn't look like those things were going to happen, here's what he did. He said this, I would like to repent for inaccurately prophesying that Donald Trump would win a second term as the President of the United States. And he wasn't the only one. There were several people that were prophesying, saying, this is going to happen. God says so. And on behalf of God, presuming to speak for God, these are guys, just like this man, I won't mention his name, who've been making all these predictions and using scripture and using the church as a backdrop. And they were wrong. And God did not send them. And we know in ancient Israel what happens when you say something's going to happen and it doesn't happen. Well, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. But here's a man who's repenting. And I'm glad he did. I'm glad he didn't like double down or make new predictions or make excuses. No, he actually apologized. And I'm really glad that he did that. 
Okay, it's important. But some of his followers went off the rails. They went off the rails. This is what he said after he made that apology. Over the last 72 hours, I have received multiple death threats and thousands upon thousands of emails from Christians saying the nastiest and most vulgar things I have ever heard toward my family and ministry. I truthfully never realized how absolutely triggered and ballistic thousands and thousands of saints get about Donald Trump. It's terrifying. It's full of idolatry. Well, he's right. And the response is horrible. It's bad enough to make predictions that don't happen. It makes the church look pretty bad. It's even worse when followers are acting this way and using vulgarities and violence and doing crazy things supposedly in the name of Jesus. This is very bad witness. Um... Here's another prophecy by a famous televangelist. I won't say who it is. This is what he actually said. This is beforehand. He says, I believe something dramatic is going to happen before Congress votes on those electors. Something very dramatic that will change the outcome of that vote. Here's a, a televangelist prophesying a prophecy that did not take place. A lot of people were frustrated and angry, and it's probably resulted in the Capitol riots. You know, a lot of people are blaming Donald Trump. No, actually, it's these prophecies and the followers who are the biggest part of all of that. And we're just going off the rails because these prophecies, it didn't look like they were going to take place. This is a long article. I'm just going to finish this article with this statement. It's from uh, an author named Holly Pivik. I hope I pronounced her name properly. She's co-author of a book called A New Apostolic Reformation. I don't know anything about this book, but this is what she says. She says, it's, it's about Christians claiming to be modern day prophets says the failed prophecy surrounding Trump brought shame to the church. I agree. They hurt its witness to the watching world. They've undermined the faith of believers and they've made it more difficult for Christians to share the gospel going forward. Think about the damage that has been done to the church here. Okay? damage and we're talking about a lot of things like conspiracy theories okay that's another arm of this is all these conspiracy theories that people that are supposedly Christians that are proposing in the name of Jesus and using scriptures and carrying crosses and have you guys ever he heard of the QAnon the QAnon it's a conspiracy theory it's horrible it's supposedly from Christians look this is a very bad witness for the church. Conspiracy theory. We're not about conspiracy theories. We're about truth. Jesus came full of grace and truth, not conspiracy theories. Okay? And we, as Christians, should not be paying attention to conspiracy theories and things that are going to happen. Social media is a huge part of that because that's how this thing goes viral. And I've got to tell you, I've heard some things on social media that have just made me cringe as I think about a future person checking out Christianity, hearing this from a Christian and thinking, man, oh man, this is really horrible. And you know what's going to happen? We're already hearing it. We're already hearing about it. They're going to lump together all Christians into the same basket. And they're going to call Christians terrorists because of some of these awful things that have happened. And people are going to start saying, well, Christians are the problem. Well, not all Christians are like that. And because of a few, we're going to be lumped together and persecuted and looked at as being terrorists because of the actions of some. This is very serious. We are not to be paying attention to these things. And our allegiance is to Jesus. Our allegiance, we should not be looking at this in a nationalistic way. Okay? This is not about the nation. Look, 
I love America. I love the United States of America. I pledge allegiance to the flag to the, of the United States of America. I am an American. I'm proud of our founding fathers. I'm proud of the way that Christian principles built this nation. It was built on Christian principles. Okay? I am a firm believer in that. But our allegiance is to Jesus, which is above that. Now, you can't see this from the camera here, but we have an American flag over here in our sanctuary. It's in our sanctuary. Okay, we, we pledge allegiance to our nation because we believe God has blessed this nation. And we're supposed to be praying for our leaders and we're supposed to be uh, praying for, for our president and for all those who are representing us. We're supposed to be praying for them whether we like them or not. But there's a second flag over here and it's called the Christian flag. And that's our allegiance to that flag. And whenever the two aren't the same, whenever the nationalistic comes up and says something to go against the Christian belief, the, Christ, the law of Christ, the things that have been told to us that God has commanded, well, guess what? I, my allegiance to the Christian movement is above the nation. So I'm not saying we shouldn't be patriotic, but our patriotic and our politics should not be mixed with the church. And it is not in God's name. He did not say these things. And unfortunately, because of the words of some, it's hurting the movement of the Christian church. It's a shame. It really is. So what are we supposed to be doing? What are we supposed to be saying? If it's not a nationalistic thing, if it's not allegiance to a country, it, I'm not saying we, we don't have freedom of, of speech. We do. I'm not saying don't support your government. We should. What I'm saying is that governments come and go. They rise, they fail. The church of Jesus has not failed, and it continues, and it will not fail. Our allegiance is first and foremost to Jesus. And we are not to be saying things that are not coming from God. If it's not in here, it's already been written. If it's not speaking the words that have been given to us by Christ through the Spirit in this Word, then there's something wrong. Okay, if somebody comes to you and says, I have a word from the Lord, they're presuming to be a prophet. They're presuming to be somebody who has a message. They're saying that Jesus isn't telling you everything. God gave me more. That's a big problem. If it's me, I'm going to back up slowly. And when I have enough distance, I'm going to run. This is a big, big problem. When somebody says, I have a word from the Lord, they're presuming to be a prophet. Jesus never said, there will be more prophets. Jesus never said, go into all the world and make prophets. He said, make disciples. Don't, they're not even to make more apostles. The apostle group are a unique group that Jesus taught. We're to make disciples, not prophets. There are People in the New Testament church that are identified with the label prophets, but every case, every case that we see, they're teachers. Paul was called a prophet and a teacher. They teach what God's word already said, what Jesus has already made clear to us. They explain it. That's what a prophet is in the New Testament church, okay? It's a label. It's not like the Old Testament prophets, and it's don't presume to be Jesus and say, I have a word from the Lord. This is becoming a big problem, and there are people who are claiming that, and you need to be aware of it. So what should we be doing? What should people see? When they see you, should they see you in the middle of all this violence? Should they see you or hear you saying things that are violent in words? Or should they see something else? Well, I think they should see something else. I picked Philippians 4 because I thought that was probably the best place to go. There's other places, but we're going to pick Philippians 4. This is what people should see in your life and my life. Not prophetic messages. Not going after conspiracy theories. Not 
rising the nationalistic of our nation above God, or even in the name of God, no, they should see this. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says. And these words are given to Paul by Jesus, by the way. Jesus had a face-to-face -face meeting with Paul, okay? Jesus is speaking through the word of God, and Paul is the messenger. Not a prophet. He's simply writing the things that Jesus is saying through the Spirit. And this is it. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evidence, evident to all the Lord is near. People need to see, it needs to be evident to people, your gentleness, not your riotness. Okay? Do not be anxious about anything. Look, there's lots of things that we could be anxious about. We don't need to be anxious about these things. Even if things are bad right now, we don't need to be anxious. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You're going to do this with gentleness. There's prayer involved. You're going to beseech God. You don't need to be anxious. And what is the result of that? What is the result when you re present your request to God? What's going to happen? This is going to happen. And the peace of God, that's what comes. The peace of God which transcends all understanding. Look, you can't even, you don't know enough and I don't know enough to get this. There is a peace from God that is above even our ability to understand. It transcends all understanding. Will guard your hearts and mind. Guard your hearts from this crazy stuff. Guard your hearts and minds from the spiritual enemy who wants very much to take you down, the church down, and everybody with it, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Because he is the final prophet. He's the one we listen to. He's the one that's given us his word. And it's closed. Everything's been said that needs to be said. And we simply Go by what Jesus has said. And if somebody comes and says, I have a word from the Lord. Oh, and it's not in here. This is a fresh word. This is a word that is new now. It's not in here, but it, God gave it to me to give it to you. Run. Okay? Run. That's, that's a false prophet. All right? It's in Christ Jesus that we get the very peace of God. Okay? Is God still in control? Yes, he is. The church is still growing. The church will be damaged, but the church is still growing. It's, it, it, as a side note, uh, it's growing so fast over in places like China that the government doesn't even know what to do about it. it. It may not be growing in certain places, but it is growing around the globe. God is in control. Don't be anxious. Don't listen to conspiracy theories. Don't listen to prophets who come. Jesus is the final prophet. All right? Take this away. Set this verse to memory. If you memorize this verse, it's going to help you a lot, right? It's Philippians 4, 7. We've already read it. It's the peace of God. That's what you need. That's what I need. And this is what people need to see. In a Christian, they need to see the peace of God in your own gentleness, right? The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, okay? You're not going to figure it out. But it comes in such a way that we don't even understand because it's bigger than us, okay? It's going to guard your hearts and minds. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want your hearts and minds to be guarded? And it's going to be in Christ Jesus, not someone else. He's to tell us everything. Not some things and other prophets will come and tell us other things. No, Jesus is the one we listen to. God said, listen to him. Didn't he? Didn't he? Rejoice in the Lord always. That's what people need to see. That's what's going to be a witness. Not whether we're right on a prophecy. These are dangerous things. And it's hurting the witness of the church. Don't go that way. Don't follow that. 
Know God's word. Read what Jesus says in his word. It's the entire word is Jesus' word that comes through the Spirit from Jesus. We have it today, and this is what we go by. Okay? Amen? I hope that's helpful to you. Okay, be careful. We're living in troubled times, and we may pay a price for what some people are doing. Okay, if there's trouble that comes, okay, it won't be the first time that Christians have been in trouble won't be the first time they've been persecuted. You be gentle. You have the peace of God around you no matter what happens because he will guard your hearts and mind. In Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Father, um, we're really saddened by the, the example of some who are purporting, purporting to be Christians and, and to be representatives of Jesus. And Father, it has hurt the witness of the church. But we do trust in you and we do know the words of Jesus that said that nothing is going to prevail against this church, not even hell itself. We believe that and we can have a peace about that and we can rejoice because we know that you are in control. Your son Jesus is our final prophet. We're to listen to him. Father, help us not to get distracted by the things going on around us. Help us to always have allegiance to the kingdom of God over and above any other kingdom on this earth. We give you praise for your promises and that you're always there. You never leave us or forsake us. We give you praise for that. So give us comfort. Give us the peace that only comes from you so that we are not anxious and so that we continue to trust you. Father, help us at the times that we struggle with this. We ask this blessing in the name of Jesus, our prophet, yes, our prophet, our Lord and Savior, the name Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.